again. This is the second in a series of two videos about uh, finite element analysis using bar elements and it's another in an extended series about finite elements in general. Okay, where we left off here was we left off right there and we knew what we had to find and we, had, we knew that we needed bar elements. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you first how to make a bar element, the mathematical description of a bar element, and then how to assemble two bar elements into a structure that includes all this. Okay? So let's start first. We need a mathematical description of a bar element. What that's going to look like is this right here. There's going to be a bar that only has stiffness along this axis. It's not, it doesn't bend this way at all. Okay? It's only allowed to move this way. And there's grid point number one, there's grid point number two. Now I'm going to assume that there could be a force one on that side and a force two on that side. There's going to be two forces and there's only going to be two possible displacements. Remember it only moves along the uh, axis of the bar. So the displacement along that direction is going to be, I'll call it x1 and displacement there is x2. Now I'm just putting those arrows below the bar there just to keep them out of the way. There's not, that's not really a moment there. And, of course, the positive x direction is right there. Okay? Now, when I'm trying to make a finite element, a mathematical description of a finite element, what I'm trying to do is write out an equation that looks like this. Okay? F equals kx. That's the same equation we had for a nice linear coil spring. Only I'm going to do this in matrix notation like that. This is what's called the force vector. These two elements, these two components right there, F1 and F2, those make up the force vector. X is the displacement vector, and that's X1 and X2. And this is called the element stiffness matrix. In fact, a lot of times you'll see an E, either subscript or superscript. Okay, so force vector, stiffness matrix, displacement vector. Well, we know that F equals F1, F2. And we have an external force up here, so we're going to know what that is in here in a minute. So we're okay there. X looks just like this. Right, so that's easy. The only part which we're working on now is this thing right here, this element stiffness matrix. So we're going to do that right now. Now my little board is out of room here, so I'm going to erase all this stuff, except for maybe my, my little diagram here. I don't need, yeah, let's keep that stuff. Oh, I shouldn't have erased that. So that's one, and that's two. Okay, so what I need to do now is I need to write a matrix expression that relates forces and displacements. Well, you might remember from strength of materials that change in length equals FL over AE. Okay, where there's E, there's A, and we had L there a second ago, I just erased it. Alright, that looks pretty good. That's almost a relationship between force and displacement. So, let's see here. If I say that uh, delta L is change in length, that's going to be one displacement minus another one. Let's do this. If I say uh, A, E over L, I'm going to push those two over there, it's X2 minus X1 equals F2. All right, that's an expression at this end. And the reason I was able to write that down, so let's draw a little free body diagram of just the end there, okay? That's F2. That's the force, that's the internal force in the element right there. Now we already know that equals F1, but let's just leave it as F for right now. Okay, and there's X2. Well, I need X2 minus X1 to keep this positive. So that's what that's going to look like. At the other end, when I have the exact opposite going on, all right? pretty obvious there's going to be a minus sign in there. Well, another way to say this is if I sum the forces over the whole thing, and I know that the thing has to be in static equilibrium, this bar has to be in static equilibrium, I know that's true. Okay. Static equilibrium requires that to be true. 
So if that's let's let's uh, well, let me erase some of this stuff. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write that equation, and I'm going to write one more that's almost like it, except there's going to be a minus sign. So let's do it this way: or f1 equals minus f2. Okay, see where I'm headed here? Let's start with just this expression right there. Okay, which comes directly from an expression we already know about for bar elements. And if that's F2, then F1 equals minus AE over L X2 minus X1. Okay. All I gotta do now, see these are these are two different expressions. These are not the same equation. I can write these out as a matrix expression. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write them out in order so x1 appears first and x2 appears second. So here's, my, here's what I'm going to write. 1 equals a e over l minus, oops, x1 minus x2. Okay? What I did is I put that minus sign inside there and I just reversed the order of those two right there. And the other thing I said is F2 equals A E over L minus X1 plus X2. Okay? That's that expression right there. So let's write this in matrix form, right? Well, that's obviously the force vector. Equals, well, that term is the same in both of them, so I'm going to put that out front. There you go. That's what a finite element looks like. This is the mathematical description of a bar element. Now, this is called the element stiffness matrix, the element force vector, and the element displacement vector. This is assuming the element's horizontal. The reason I drew the problem earlier like I did is to keep everything horizontal. Okay? Next video, I'll show you what to do if they're not horizontal, but that doesn't matter right now. That's just a coordinate transformation. It's a mathematical detail we can worry about later, okay? So this is a bar element. That's what... That's the mathematical description. That's a finite element, okay? So all i got to do now is i got to figure out how to add these in to that to add them together to make that bigger structure. So let's go back to that. Um, let's see, I'll leave that there for a minute. Get rid of all this stuff. Okay, and draw back my, my uh, bar here, my larger structure, I guess I should say. And that was 0 0.7 meters. Gonna make that look a little longer, a little longer maybe. Okay, that's one meter there. That was 20,000 newtons, if I remember right. And I had my little support there to keep it horizontal. So that's my problem. I'm trying to find x2. Okay, that was grid point one, grid point two, grid point three, right? Now, here's what I gotta do. I have an element stiffness matrix for that. I have another element stiffness matrix for that element. I have to combine them into something called the global stiffness matrix. Right, so what I'm going to do is erase this to make some room. I've got three grid points. I have one degree of freedom at every grid point. Turns out I'm going to have a three by three global stiffness matrix to start. I'm eventually going to constrain the problem and I'm going to eliminate two of those degrees of freedom. It's pretty obvious that there's no displacement there, there's no displacement there, there can't be, those are the supports. There can only be displacement there. So eventually I'm only going to have a one by one matrix. Well that's just a scalar. All right, told you this was the smallest problem I could think of. So here's what it's going to look like. F1, F2, F3, that's my global force vector. I'll put in the uh, numbers there in a second. All right, so there we go. Now, E and A doesn't change. L1, okay, 0.7 there. I'm going to need to know that number here, and that number is, make sure I get this right, uh, 10 to the, yeah, 10 to the plus 7. 
It's 1 times 10 to the 7th. EAL2 is going to be 7 times 10 to the 6th. Okay, those are the stiffnesses. The stiffness here is lower because the element's longer. The spring's bigger, right? The shorter one has higher stiffness, bigger number there, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, just to keep, just for bookkeeping purposes, I'm going to write some numbers here. I'm going to erase those in a second. But those are going to be the first and second terms in the element one. Remember, this is element one there. And that's element two there. The element one stiffness matrix. So I got 10 to the 7, minus 10 to the 7, minus 10 to the 7, and 10 to the 7. By the way, did you notice that's a symmetric matrix? If you look at the diagonal, I can take those two numbers, flip them over, and I get the same matrix. That's called a symmetric matrix. All structural stiffness matrices, for linear finite elements anyway, all structural stiffness matrices are symmetric. You get one that's not symmetric, something's wrong, so stop. All right, now, global grid points, one, two, three. Okay, I got one and two taken care of. Now this element connects two and three. That's element grid point one, element grid point two. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add those points in there. I have to add plus seven times ten to the six there, seven times ten to the six, which I minus, minus seven times ten to the six, and seven times ten to the six. So there we go, all right? That's the other element stiffness matrix. And see where they overlap right there? Okay. The reason they overlap is both elements are connected at that point. There's a stiffness contribution from both elements at that point. Well, is there any stiffness contribution between grid point three and grid point one? No, there's no element that connects those. There's something that connects two, but there's nothing that goes directly from one to three. There's no effect of grid point three on grid point one. And for, because this is symmetric, there's no effect of grid point one on grid point three. So both of those are zero. All right, so let's, let's eliminate some stuff off the board here. Okay, I don't need those anymore, and I don't need those. I got one more problem. If I were to try to invert that, by the way, this is, let's write this out as, uh, let's see, 17 times 10 to the 6th right there. Okay, make sure I got that right. Yes, I do. Okay. If I plug that into your calculator and try to invert it, you'll get an error. You can't invert it. The reason is this is called a singular matrix. Okay. So trying to invert this matrix is like trying to divide by zero. Singular is the matrix version of trying to divide by zero. Right? The reason is that as it stands right now, this, the constraints aren't there. This thing's just floating in space. A finite force will give me an infinite motion because I, don't, you know, I, I, will, I still have degrees of freedom one and three. All right? Finite force, infinite motion sounds like dividing by zero to me. And that's what's going on. I need to take into account the fact that x1 is 0 and x3 is 0. Now, because I'm in a hurry, I'm just, you know, have only a few minutes left here, I'm just going to tell you how we do that. Every time you have, you need to eliminate a degree of freedom from your finite element model, you simply cross out that row and that column from your problem. Okay? Degree of freedom number one is constrained. That's the lingo. It means it can't move. So I get rid of row one, column one. Degree of freedom three is constrained. I get rid of row three and column three. And what I've got left is a one by one matrix problem. That's really a scalar problem. I have F2 equals 17 times 10 to the sixth X2. And if you work that out, by the way, that equals 20,000 newtons, remember? And that's an external force now. We know what that is. So I've got one equation, one unknown. X2 turns out to be 1.18 millimeters. All right. Skipped a few of the details in order to keep this video short, but that's we've just done a finite element uh, problem. Simplest one I could think of, but that's a finite element problem. We identified which elements we needed to use, wrote out the element stiffness matrices combine them into a global stiffness matrices matrix, applied our constraints to take our singular matrix and turn it into a non-singular matrix, one that can be inverted, 
and we found our displacement. We're done.